Exploring theology, doctrine, and all of the fascinating subjects in between, broadcasting from an undisclosed location, Dead Men Walking starts now. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Dead Men Walking Podcast. Thanks for coming along for the ride. We appreciate your support. Visiting dmwpodcast.com supports the show. We got a snarky merch site there, too, if you ever want to check out any of our T-shirts, hats, anything like that. We do this all for the glory of God, obviously, Ephesians 2, dead in our sins and trespasses, but now alive in Christ. Welcome to Dead Men Walking. Um, we always try to bring you guys great guests, um, good information, try to bring value to you. And with that, we also partner with people too on the podcast that bring value to you, business owners, entrepreneurs, things like this. Now, you've heard me talk about these guys before, page 50. They're a distinctly Christian marketing agency striving to help Christians own businesses, grow businesses, and succeed in a digital age. They don't want to just make a paycheck. They want to change the world. And that means building it right alongside you. Page 50 doesn't just exist as a Christian alternative, but their goal is to put your business front and center in your market so you can advance the kingdom of God in every corner possible. And their mission is bigger than just Sunday. They want to work with guys like you. If you own a business, you're a business influencer. They do Google CEO. They do websites. They do all the stuff you need to do for social media. Visit page50.com. That's spelled out P-A-G-E-F-I-F-T-Y.com. Integrity, innovation, results. Go to page50.com. We like those guys, Stuart and those gentlemen over there. They've helped us on the podcast. They've helped some of our other friends in the area here. And we've sent a couple people their way. So we only partner with people we believe in, and we appreciate them being support of this podcast, and we support them as well. So now that the business is out of the way, let's get to the meat of the program. Usually I might do a couple minutes, uh, you know, maybe talk about how the week's going, but I want to get right into it because I'm excited about this gentleman. He's the CEO of New Founding, which is a venture firm and talent network. You can find him on Twitter at Nate Fisher. He's also co-founder of American Reformer, I believe it's called. American yeah. Reformer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Nate Fisher. Nate, how are you, sir? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, give us like a minute or two on, uh, I gave you a short bio, but let the listeners know if they don't know you. Um, give us a little bio on yourself so we know who we're talking to today. Sure. Well, uh, I'll, I'll start with, uh, since you started with what I'm doing now, I'll start with a uh, very quick background. I grew up Christian. I grew up in upstate New York, homeschooled uh, before it was cool, as I say. I, yeah, me too. I, Let's go. Back when you had to worry about the cops coming to your house up there, if you uh, they came to my front door, yes, did they? Well, uh, <laughs> I I was just I was just digging through yesterday. I was actually cleaning some old uh, old records and was digging through some stuff from my uh, my childhood, and I saw letters back and forth between Homeschool Legal Defense Association and the uh, local school district about my yeah. alleged truancy or whatever. But I uh, didn't I uh, didn't didn't hurt me too much. I I, I uh, survived, uh, grew in my faith as a result. I think and. I uh, Went to Christian college, went to law school. I had always been interested in politics, always been interested in uh, technology, and was always interested in business. And really mm. realized uh, during a summer in D.C. that politics at the time was a place where sort of careerists would climb their way to the top in a very boring way. And mm. uh, business, you make a non-consensus but correct bet, and you can make a lot of money. So I uh, knew what I wanted to do. And I went into business, uh, did ne never practice law. I... Uh, Graduated in 2010 uh, in the middle of the financial crisis, or sort of coming out of the financial crisis, moved to Florida, started buying uh, apartment buildings, partnered with a classmate to start buying distressed apartment buildings in Florida and then Texas. And really our thesis was there were great demographics there. Uh, whatever the distress was at that moment, if we held on, it would come back. Proved to be, it was an incredible way to uh, get started just jumping into starting a business in a very real space in a sense uh, very practical from the mm. beginning so great education in business that went very well we ended up with about seven thousand apartments uh within three years and wow. uh team of 300 people and then uh and then look for what to do next because we weren't real estate guys uh we were ultimately uh, what i've always been drawn to is what are going to be the big opportunities during that time met my wife got married uh had uh, had we, had we now have four kids uh, and uh, and homeschool and nice that drew me on sort of a, a path over several years of really looking for what the next big themes are going to be and that drew me to uh, two themes that sort of intersect one is how technology is impacting especially organization and trust I uh, 
business, mm. especially dealing with contractors, is all about making trust-based judgments, certainly essentially trust, credit, credibility, all in the same category. And I've been interested for year hiring. Hiring is a big good example of that. And I've been interested for years in how that is going to be changed. It, I think we all recognize there's a lot of problems with how that process has has gone. It's really dominated by uh, these sort of university cartels at this point that increasingly bureaucratize it. And I was mm. very, very interested in what uh, what a alternative could be, how technology could actually help disrupt that in a positive way. And that really intersected uh, during the Trump era and especially 2020 with a recognition that my old assumption about politics was no longer true. And now you had the disruptive idea, the Trump and the disruptive forces uh, pushing aside the, uh, the the Mitt Romney careerist types. And that was actually a, uh, a, a domain of major paradigm shift, uh, driving major changes in the country. And actually, the intersection of those two was where there was real opportunity, because it was precisely people on the right, people who are uh, largely alienated by current institutions, uh, especially conservative Christians who are sort of profoundly uh, uh, desiring something else, who are going to be the uh, the most hungry early adopters of any new uh, alternative model for uh, for the allocation of talent, for the matching of uh, matching of people outside of existing networks. So that led to new founding, which is ultimately uh, focused on talent and how do we match people and opportunities. And uh, venture, yeah. in many ways, is just a, a higher end of that because uh, venture is about the opportunities when they're uh, when they're not existing businesses or when they're very early stage. So we're uh, we're focused on ultimately finding alternative ways, alternative networks to build that can really provide a viable alternative all the way up to the top uh, on the economic side. And then American Reformer fits directly with that, which is uh, we we need to be uh, deeply grounded in the historical Protestant tradition to come up with a positive alternative vision. In venture, you don't you don't win by being sort of conservative when that merely means uh, say no, say slow down to things. You need an alternative positive vision to inspire people. What are they building toward? And that again mm. has been a real passion of mine. Uh, finally, live in Dallas. I believe Dallas is the natural capital of Red America. Uh, <laughs> A lot of work to do to to really build that up, but I think to the extent we have alternative networks, we need uh, true alternative cities that are uh, that, that have the scale to be alternatives to New York, to uh, to places like San Francisco and L.A. Because uh, we can't keep uh, going there uh, in little just little underground dissident networks. There, we need an alternative. So I think this was a, a longer intro than you uh, you asked for, but it was <laughs> no, it's running okay. through a lot of threads that uh, a lot of threads that got me to where I am. Yeah. Well, look, at. I think we're going to be kindred spirits on this episode. Uh, we were talking a little bit about how you were homeschooled and I was homeschooled and, you know, cops come and knock it on your door. So we have that in common. My, my mom and dad uh, started in 1989 when I was in fourth, third or fourth grade, I think. And then obviously business. I'm a business owner. I'm in real estate. I'm a real estate broker and I'm also a county commissioner. So I also too am in, involved and in, in interested in business and politics and, and all those things. So I think we're, we're going to have fun on this one. Um, so you, can I, before we get into kind of what we really want to start talking about, which was technology, um, AI, things like that. So with new founding, um, you're matching talent and you said you're looking at tech. Well, this will kind of segue into it. You're looking at technology on how that can match people. You're looking at disruptive technology. What's something at new founding that you, you, you use that might be different or disruptive to, to make those matches? Are, are you using anything unique right now? So right now we're starting, uh, and this is, I think, often the the right practice with startups, even when they have a big tech vision, is, is start with something that's lower tech. Right now we're largely yeah. doing a lot of these matches uh, manually, the human back end, as they say. And uh, the I think the differentiator is we're not, we are not focused on legacy credentials and legacy institutions as yeah. the uh, as the the point of matching. So. Right now, the way we reach people is largely with our own media profile. And then our presence shows like this, where there's there's go, going to be an audience that has, they have meaningfully different values. And in many ways, they've uh, they've reached the point over the last few years where when it comes to hiring, when it comes to finding a job, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to other high value sort of business, real high value transactions, values alignment has gone from more of a, from a nice to have. I mean, people valued that for five, 10 years ago to a must have. It's now a, a deeply motivating factor. 
And uh, right now, there's not a lot of institutions. There's really no institutions that at those sort of elite levels of finance and, and talent placement and matching co-founders and all of that are uh, are ones where you can really... Uh, there, there's a lot of institutions that mediate those transactions. Virtually mm. all of those institutions have either embraced the left or have at least sort of stayed somewhat apolitical or they've tried to remain sort of normie conservative, old school sort of conservative, where you don't really know if the person who's also in that network actually shares your values about the things that matter and uh, actually share sort of a recognition with how broken the system is. And so our model is uh, draw people to a distinct message. We can take a high public profile. Many of the people on both sides of this actually don't want to fly the flag themselves for various reasons. They both can come to us and we can make those introductions. Now that yeah. model points to what I really see as the disruptive model here. The disruptive model is route these transactions, route these interactions through aligned communities through high trust networks. Basically, independent media figures like you are one of the last pillars of trust that have survived as broader trust in institutions has collapsed. I think it's independent media mm -hmm. figures and it's sometimes uh, tight, high trust communities. And in many ways, we see trust collapsing at the institutional level and we see trust either growing or remaining uh, through these independent channels. And my goal is find ways to leverage more and more of these independent channels. Good example would yeah. be if you want to if you want to reach people, could you reach them through your church? Could you also advertise a job through five or 10 uh, sort of concentric circles of aligned churches, whether they're churches, similar values in the same community, churches of sort of the same, uh, same professed values uh, around the country, depending on, on, on the need, maybe through 10 other sub stacks and podcasts that are also uh, going to have people who share those values. And so it's really a return. Our goal is a return to a much more human way. And this, this is a theme of how I approach technology generally. It's a return to a much more human way of uh, interacting with people. Uh, traditionally, those sorts of networks were actually very significant networks in getting business done and finding opportunities in, uh, in building your career. Uh, but they've gradually been crowded out by these uh, sort of elite institutions, right? Instead of yeah. working up through your through your community, you now have to sort of compete to go to the highest ranked school you can get to, which ultimately is in sort of a hierarchy that's controlled by Harvard. Ultimately, you're trying to basically get into Harvard or get into something that has followed the same formula as Harvard uh, in that rank. Then you go to uh, McKinsey or whatever, you rise your way at McKinsey or you rise your way at Ernst & Young or whatever and EY. And you're ultimately, you're sort of going through these institutions, very bureaucratic, very large scale institutions, very hostile in their values institutions. Mm. And ultimately that in turn is sort of the source of someone in your own community wants to hire like a mid-level person at a company, then they sort of expect they have to pull from those. So we've sort of replaced this area where you can rise by building trust in your community with one where you have to sort of invest everything in rising and getting the credentials of these, these outside credentialing institutions, trust meeting institutions. And then, uh, and then your own community has to sort of draw back on these credentials, which is, which gives a tremendous power to these outside ones. So my view is how do we, use technology above all how do we use technology uh to essentially shift the power back to just increase the convenience uh increase the scale of these human networks that uh remain high trust that people still have confidence in that in many cases actually share your values uh unlike these these distant institutions and that have been crowded out in a globalized economy by the uh by the ability of the the larger ones to scale. And so it's not, it's not even in some ways about revolutionary technology itself. It's much more about just build technology, uh, build technology to amplify what we have done for a long time that has worked well. Yeah. There's a couple things there that you said that are interesting. One, it sounds like you're saying, which I would assume, but I see a, pretty often in your space that you need to have a pretty solid worldview. Uh, when you're connecting talent and, and doing things like that. I know the left definitely has a worldview. I've never understood companies that try to stay apolitical or kind of in the middle or, d or don't want to say he, everyone has a worldview. Um, so, so why aren't we having companies come out with that worldview and say, well, this is what it is. And now if it's, if it's a leftist or progressive worldview, I would vehemently disagree with it. If it's someone like you who has a biblical worldview, a Christian worldview, um, I would say, yeah, let's support that company. We need more of those. We don't really have a lot of those 
in the Christian space. And I'm not uh, trying to pigeonhole you as a Christian company, but with a proper worldview, right? It, it sounds like our worldviews probably line up pr pretty closely. And I would say I'm surprised that more companies aren't kind of, I don't want to say attacking, but entering in to that type of ideal that you're doing at your company. With that being said, um, let's shift into technology a little bit because you said it interests you, you use it. Um, should we have a positive outlook on technology as believers? Because I got to tell you, I talk to a lot of um, believers outside of the, mostly outside of the reformed persuasion. But look at technology almost as end times, uh, horrible, uh, we can't use technology, it's from Satan himself kind of deal. And I go, well, no, I'm I'm uh, with the thank God for Bitcoin guys. I'm with the using platforms. And like you said, um, you know, the people who, who their trust has eroded in the kind of legacy media, you have podcasters and sub stacks and Twitter people and guys like you are in the CEO space. Um, where people will trust them and listen to them. I'm all for using that technology. Do you think we should have a positive outlook on technology and use it to the glory of God then? So absolutely. I think this is, uh, this is, this, this actually, I think illustrates sort of a conflict between the traditional conservative vision and, hmm. uh, and, and the Christian vision. I mean, it's right in Genesis one, the, the dominion mandate, the cultural mandate technology uh, is a core part of is one of the key levers by which we can accomplish that. When we create, I mean, we are made in the image of God. The first thing God did is he created our mm -hmm. own creation and not just, not just creation, not just sort of work with your hands and make something that's sort of, you know, that's a, that's a well-established thing, but God created things out of nothing. He created entire concepts out of nothing. And uh, that idea of, of, an innovative vision, creating an innovative vision is one of the most fundamentally human things we can do as we channel, uh, as we reflect that aspect of our nature made in the image of God. So I think it's very clear uh, that this is something that uh, is natural to Christians, is good for Christians. The question comes down, it's a lever. It's a lever, uh, just yeah. like financial leverage in a way, and it can be used for good or ill, uh, just like military leverage, right? You can use it for good or ill. Uh, the question is, are you using are you using it to accomplish that Genesis one vision, a proper vision, or are you using it for something much more like the Tower of Babel? And in many ways, I, which is much more, I think, transhumanism, right? In many ways, those I see sure. as the two, the two sort of poles of technology. Uh, now, I think there's sort of additional reasons that we should be friendly to technology. We are at a profound disadvantage in many, many, many domains of society. We have these legacy institutions across the board controlled by our enemies. Why should we not? Why should we not? absolutely embrace any sort of disruptive technology. Disruptive technology by its very nature is something that can change the balance of power. It can disrupt the incumbents. And when those incumbents almost uniformly hate us, then disruptive technology should be one of our greatest friends. It mm. should be the tool that if we if, if we use it more effectively than they do, uh, it, it, at the very least, the mere existence of a disruptive technology offers the potential to reshuffle the deck. And yeah. Not uh, that gives us a, an opportunity. If we embrace it, then we actually can be in the in, in the game there. Now, I think conservatives, and this is this is a, a sort of interesting theory. Uh, conservatives have been suspicious of technology because sort of they try to sidestep. There's a great uh, they try to sort of sidestep those fundamental questions of what should we aspire to, what are the fundamental values we aim for, uh, and they largely just try to conserve the good things that have been preserved over time. And technology yeah. fundamentally undermines that. By its very nature, technology essentially guarantees that conservatives will lose because whatever is a sort of good norm or tradition is going to be disrupted by technology sooner or later. Uh, now, if if that technology is also guided by the same sort of fundamental principles, uh, virtuous fundamental principles, there's no reason that what replaces it is going to be worse. It could be better. But if your right. if your view sort of stops at let's preserve the good things of the past, technology is absolutely a threat. It's an enemy, and so I think you see this sort of tension where uh, conservatives are suspicious of technology, but we're in a world where I think it's widely recognized, is increasingly widely recognized on the right that conservatism is it, it has failed. It has failed to preserve uh, much of what we uh, we have fought for, yeah. and we need something more. So I think that that opens the door to. Uh, a lot of questions around what what should we be using things for? And then finally, 
one last thing is I think we have some tremendous advantages with technology. We understand the person better. And so much of technology right. comes down to the nature of the person. If you're trying to, if you're trying to beat someone, if you're trying to win a competition, then we should absolutely look at what is our enemy's Achilles heel. And the the Achilles heel of people in Silicon Valley is they have a profoundly pessimistic view of the human person. They don't understand the human person we do the way we do. They don't understand that creation, the image of God. And they overall have a pessimistic view that assumes that tech, that AI can replace uh, almost every aspect of, uh, of people. And so they're constantly trying to build technology to replace the person. If you believe that technology, if you believe in a, a low view of the person, you're going to try to replace the person. I, yeah. I believe that's not true. I believe that there's tremendous uh, potential there that in many cases, technology has not been designed to uh, to capture and to leverage. And if we mm. do so, we should be able to build more powerful, uh, more productive, more valuable networks than the other side. And we should be the uh, the winners in many of those games of disruption. Yeah, and I, I think uh, if you look through history, uh, believers have been uh, accepting of disruptive technologies. Um, the printing press is a great example. Uh, one of the first books printed, the Bible, and, and it was used to advance the gospel throughout the world. Um, and that was a very disruptive technology, bringing literature to the masses, things like that. Uh, I would also say, I don't know if you agree with this, but it kind of popped into my head when you were talking. I've been talking for two or three years now, and, and probably before that, that conservatism is almost dead uh, because they don't really know what their worldview is based on. They had some principles. And look at I grew up in my 20s calling myself a conservative. I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, I was also working through uh, the Bible when the Lord saved me at 20. I said the sinner's prayer at seven and was saved at 24. Uh, and working through Reformed theology and worldview and, and general equity and theonomy and all these different things. Uh, but conservatism, what does it stand on? And if they're going to reject technology, which I don't believe we can as believers or as the general public, uh, they're going to be left behind. And then you see major conservative outlets like Daily Wire and these other things and PragerU and all these things coming up where they're celebrating the the adoption of a gay marriage and uh, you know with uh, Ruben and and Prager a couple of weeks ago saying hey you know porn isn't bad as long as you're you're not committing adultery and these are the these are the guys that are speaking for conservatism and they've already given way and I think it's because the foundation of their worldview I don't know what they it's not founded really on anything except some principles that say hey like you said let's preserve the good things of the past when technology's changing and the world's changing. With that being said, one of the big concerns I have moving forward is AI, artificial intelligence. We've seen this, uh, especially over the last year with, with the chat bots and uh, Elon Musk bringing it to the forefront uh, with some of the technologies he's coming in with. And we did an episode on this uh, probably six months ago, so you can go back and listen to it if any of the listeners want to. But just talking about me, I, I have concerns with who's making who, who is setting the worldview for the AI? Now, I'm not a technical, I'm not super technical, so I, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I wanted your thoughts on if I have uh, cars that are self-driving that are based on AI or software AI writing things, uh, um, AI doing all these tasks, they have to have some type of worldview. How are they getting that worldview? Um, you, you know, a quick example was if you have a Tesla that's, let's say, totally automated, it's 10 years from now. And they're going to get in a, you know, they're going to rear end a truck in front of you and they can either rear end and possibly say, I'm going to kill the passengers, veer to the left and kill an elderly woman or veer to the right and kill a pregnant woman. Who's making what? What, who's programming that decision on who should I injure? Who should I not? What life is more valuable? Which one isn't? Now that sounds like an absurd example, but we're going to get there one day and probably very quickly. So those are the questions I have about AI. W what are you seeing in that space and, and what kind of are your concerns or do you have any on artificial intelligence moving forward? Well, absolutely. And the example you give, I think, uh, I mean, the, the one where it's easy to see uh, AI uh, pressure is, uh, Let's say uh, the two people that you could choose are uh, two different races. Uh, you can mm. easily imagine a case being made that there needs to be a uh, a sort of uh, value hierarchy. But I, I'll say I think that the first question is sort of AI itself. Uh, the nature of technology of different types of technology can advance different outcomes. And I think Teal had a line that was something like uh, Bitcoin is libertarian or crypto is libertarian and AI is communist. 
And uh, <laughs> so there's a sense in which, I mean, it makes sense, right? One is one is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the Second Amendment. It's the dis- cryptography is a distribution of power uh, broadly that, sure. that, that empowers individuals. And uh, AI enables, uh, it enables the centralized uh, decision-making, the centralized uh, making of decisions like the one you just described there. So uh, I, I don't see that as necessarily, I mean, I think I'm, I'm not a sort of, I'm not a pure libertarian. So I don't mm. uh, think that we should just sort of be suspicious of AI because it's going to be making collective decisions. In fact, I think it's it's helpful for people to realize, as you said, there is no such thing as neutrality going back to companies. Uh, AI is going to blow up this fantasy of a sort of neutral public square that conservatives have. It's another cop out of conservatives, right? They've, sure. they've sort of they, they, they've tried to pretend that we can just focus on procedural neutrality and we can focus on fighting for sort of the neutral public square and make room for our space, uh, make room for our values. But there's no neutral public square. Uh, yeah. And I would use, I think, for AI, it's actually uh, e- even easier than sort of who the Tesla decides to kill is the bigger question of just what a search engine ranks. A search engine is, is leveraging a lot of these uh, these algorithms. And you type sure. something in a search engine and there must be a number one value. There must be a number two value. There therefore must be a value system that determines that one is better than two. And that is, uh, that's a question that determines everything from what restaurant people eat at, what content they consume, uh, what what facts they believe to be true, right? And so Yelp, for instance, is deciding what restaurants live and die. Uh, whether or not you use Yelp, uh, if on the margins it directs enough people, that determines who lives and dies. And so that's, and Yelp, by the way, has a uh, checkbox in their, their thing for whether there's gender neutral bathrooms there. Does that factor into their sort of overall Yelp score and their ranking? I, I don't know, but I bet yeah. it does. I, they don't necessarily tell us the role it plays, but that may be a factor in determining what restaurants uh, live and die. Well, I would so say we're seeing changed. that right now with algorithms, though, too. That's, that's yeah. not something in the future. We're seeing that type of algorithm uh, being put into play with Google and other search engines as well. Yeah, exactly. So that value that value question is already. I think it's in the nature of digital disruption, and so this idea mm-hmm. that. Uh, now, I think that's sort of disturbing to a lot of people who, who who like to think, well, I'm not being shaped by technology. I'm an autonomous individual or whatever. It's never been true of anyone. You've always been shaped by your community. You've always been shaped by norms. So this question of who catechizes the bots, as uh, a colleague, James Poulos, likes to put it, is actually uh, is actually a restoration of this classic question of what's the sort of civic religion of a, uh, of, of a society. And uh, every society, every culture has had these values. And as much as we've we've liked to uh, pretend that we can have this sort of liberal neutrality or whatever, uh, yeah, we've already been catechized as a society with a, a set of values. AI just sort of uh, AI doubles down on that, has it sort of more efficiently scaled to more more segments of society, uh, but it's raising questions that have been questions uh, as old as time. And so I think that who who is going to the, the fundamental question of our era will be that question of who catechizes the algorithms. What religion ultimately catechizes right. the algorithms? And, Just the uh, ethic and morality of it is, is what's concerning about me. That An AI will have to have some type of, whether it's artificial or not, an ethic and morality. Uh, right now, we all pretty much agree on, well, if, if, you're, if you're born, that murder is wrong. We, we still agree on that mostly in this, in this country. That's a pretty big philosophical you know, statement, but there's a lot of little things underneath there that can get lost and who's programming that ethic. Uh, we have yep. a split in this country on if murder is wrong for the preborn. I mean, that's, that's insanity to me, but that's a discussion we continue to keep having. So will AI, you know, and, and, and we're, I know I'm talking about big issues here, but those big issues of, of murder and rape and all these criminal things that we classify as wrong, We've seen over the last 30 to 40 years, especially in the last five to 10 years, that things that we thought 20 years ago would never become legal are now legal. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so that's the concern I'm having with AI and how do we as believers go, look, at we can use that technology, but I think it goes back to your point. We need to be in those spaces. We, we can't put our head yeah. in the ground and go, well, I don't want anything to do with AI. It's evil or it could be evil or it could be bad. Instead, why aren't we leaders in that space? Kind of like what your company's doing and what you've been doing sounds like your entire professional life. Yep. Well, and I think that the left absolutely recognizes this. So all right. of the sort of AI ethics, as it's called, is uh, is by and large a bunch of people on the woke left 
who recognize that neutrality. So and there's no neutrality. And so what you tend to, right. tended to see engineers default to with their algorithms was the sort of things that engineers understand, like engagement. So they'll catechize, so to speak, the Facebook algorithms to maximize the engagement of people, to give you the content that you're going to be most engaged with, because that's a very easy, measurable metric. Well, the AI ethics people uh, on the left, the woke AI people, uh, realize that that is giving uh, conservatives more conservative content, right? It's giving uh, Trump fans <laughs> more Trump fan content, and that helped spread. That actually helped disrupt the monopoly of the legacy media in a way that helped elect Trump. And uh, that may not have been the intention of the people who who created those algorithms, but they were they were engineers creating algorithms based on a sort of engineering level goal like engagement. And so they came in and they said, no, this is uh, this can't be neutral. We need to impose values here. And those values, of course, were leftist values. They they want to they want algorithms that sort of de-emphasize hate and all that stuff, uh, which obviously yeah. we know what that means. And so where, whereas you have a lot of people who are conservatives who go back to say, well, we just need <clears throat> we need the uh, the big tech platforms to stay neutral. Well, neutral is not possible. That's not as we've said, it's not possible. Uh, we're, we're essentially arguing for something that can't happen rather than recognizing the reality of it. Now, I think what we what we want most likely in the space like AI is we're not at a point today where we have enough power to actually get the big tech platforms to uh, to have their algorithms reflect our values. Uh, now, yeah. Twitter's an interesting one. Twitter's, Twitter's an exception there where I think there's there's someone who's much, much friendlier to uh, to at least some degree of uh, of uh, alternative values or pluralism. But I think the best is, is can we uh, can we go for a system where there's multiple AIs, where it's a degree of pluralism, because uh, the alternative is centralized AI with centralized values really converging toward a CCP model, which is uh, which is probably the biggest threat we face today. Uh, an alternative yeah. is something where there's open source AI models. There's uh, and again, they're going to use just like they use the threat of of global warming and and uh, rising sea and all sorts of catastrophic uh, apocalyptic destruction as a pretext to control every aspect of our lives uh, uh, economically. They're going to use the threat of uh, AI driven uh, apocalypse of uh, AGI uh, sure. to uh, try to regulate anything that's independent. They're going to try to essentially force it into a set of bounds that are controlled very centrally by these largest companies. Uh, that is that is ultimately a way of imposing, again, CCP level control of every aspect of our lives. We need, just like Bitcoin allows sort of a, uh, a, a distribution of the power of, of money, we need a distribution of the power of, uh, of AI. And there's a lot of open questions about whether this is possible. It may be that it's not possible. But in the short term, I think the biggest thing we should be fighting is centrally controlled AI by the companies that we know right. are going to use that in a uh, in a terrible way. No, absolutely. And look, at you're absolutely right. Uh, large governments, even small governments, uh, Jefferson called them necessary evils. Uh, they want to centralize power. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Fed now that the Biden administration is looking at implementing yep. next year. But it's essentially a way to track all digital payments um, online. So not only can they tax them, but they can track what you're buying, selling, aftermarket. Even if it's something on, let's say, Facebook Marketplace and you've already purchased it, paid, paid sales tax on it, and you want to sell an old coffee table for $50, guess what? It's getting taxed. It's going in our uh, data servers. And, and we know that when you bought it, when you sold it, and if you reported on it. So th that's something that's reactionary to uh, crypto in one sense. And that's a very small part of it. Um, but that kind of leads me into our very last subject here as we kind of wrap this up. Uh, because I know you said you're interested in politics. I'm a locally elected county uh, commissioner. I've been a liaison in our state capital. Um, you know, worked on national campaigns, campaign manager for a few state run senators and things like that. Always been interested in it. In high school, I wrote a senior thesis on the buying of Congress. So always very interested in the hypocrisy of elected officials and things like that. Now we're seeing, um, you, know, you know, I'm in I'm in the in the camp of what false choice do I want, A or B, the Democrats or Republicans? Um, I see it on a local level, state level, and national level. And it's looked like the two parties are quickly, quickly eroding into the same party. Um, some would argue it's been that way for maybe a decade or longer. Why has that happened? Uh, maybe get your opinion on that. 
And what is our response to that? Because they're such a, they have such a stranglehold on the money, uh, on the power that it's very hard for third, fourth, fifth parties to even, to, to even enter. Um, how do we combat that? And what does it mean when we see both parties essentially look at, they, they both have some distinctives, you know, heck Republicans don't even run on tax cuts anymore. They, they're pretty much just running on, you know, anti-trans woke stuff. If they can get some votes and some pro-life people that never come through, uh, that, that's what they run on. And then the left is just running wild. So what do we, what do we do in those situations? Like we're at now to where it seems like it's two sides, uh, of the same coin. Um, our, our main parties are eroding. Um, I think going back to what you said with Trump that I knew he was going to win. I pat myself on the back every day. He was at 3% polling. My father and I had a discussion. We said, if there was just someone that, uh, essentially it was when Romney was, was uh, running and he apologized to Obama for having a book full of women. I don't know if you remember that he's of women to be able to go to and hire. And, and, and he apologized for that and for earning $200 million. And my father and I said in 2000, I think it was, what was it? Eight, uh, seven. You know, if there was just a president that came out and said, yeah, I'm really wealthy and it's because I use the system and I don't care and I don't want to pay taxes, he'll win. And then a few years later, Trump runs and essentially says that he was part of that disruptor of our two major parties eroding and people fed up with it. So what do we do as believers when we see those parties eroding? Um, how do we respond politically? What do you, what do you think? So several thoughts here. I mean, one is I think the party itself in many ways is an institution that's just another vehicle for, it's an outlet for uh, competition. And, and ultimately, I'm not ready to give up on the Republican Party. I think it's worthwhile to, uh, it, it's worthwhile. It, it is a vehicle that certainly has checked uh, a lot of uh, a lot of bad things. Uh, it's failed to check many others. But uh, e even if we view the national level as sort of at best defensive, uh, we want to have a presence there. We should also be competing. We should be competing to potentially view it as an institution that we can capture and we can turn. Uh, but mm -hmm. at the same time, there's a reason I'm focused where I am. And I view politics fundamentally as more than just electoral politics. I view politics fundamentally as all of these questions of how do you organize society. So I'd actually mm -hmm. say private sector is, is an outlet. What I'm doing, I view as profoundly political. I uh, Focusing on technology and the direction of technology and the values that are going to shape AI is a profoundly political question. And uh, so I see it as, as likely that there's fewer structural impediments to uh, organizing people at a large scale and essentially accumulating power quickly through a lot of private sector driven means, uh, whether they are independent media, whether they're networks that help leverage and scale, uh, add an economic layer onto uh, a lot of these independent, uh, uh, independent communities that are growing. And so, and yet that's power that just as much is political, especially as we start to get into questions like, like building the technology that actually shapes. I mean, the policy, I would say the policy that goes into Google's algorithm that determines what's ranked how is at least as important a policy in many cases as policy as, as laws that are passed by Congress. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. The people there who are shipping there are at least as powerful. So I wouldn't view politics as sort of a, a fundamentally distinct domain. I would say classic electoral politics is obviously a different space. And then I would say uh, the other domain that we know matters. And this is what I say. Uh, the, it, it, I don't know what the structure of, of, of politics and of power will be post-digital disruption. We've seen profound disruptions before. You referenced the printing press. After the printing press, you had Protestant Reformation. You had the Thirty Years' War. You had a fundamentally different shift from a, a medieval society, a feudal society, uh, I should say, to uh, a yeah. Westphalian one where there was much more integrated government. We're going to see profound disruption of the entire structure of sovereignty based on digital disruption. And I don't know if we know what that looks like, but I do know there's two layers that matter. One, one will be the digital, and we must be fighting for the, the digital. And the other will be the local. So you talk about being a county commissioner, who you live next to will always matter. It doesn't matter what digital world you're operating in. If your neighbor is, uh, if your neighbor is good, that's good. If your neighbor's bad, that's bad. And so I think that we should absolutely be fighting for local institutions. We should be fighting for our counties. Uh, those counties can be significant. Uh, they can be significant uh, bastions against tyranny, right? You have sheriffs, uh, sure. sheriffs blocking COVID. Uh, COVID mechanisms. And so in many ways, at the at the local level, there's very real, very practical political questions you can get into. In many ways, the sort of party apparatus is also a little bit less, uh, 
a little bit less rigid. There's a lot more room for sort of a broader range to happen through uh, through one, uh, uh, whether it's it's sort of a disruptive side of one party. So I think that uh, yeah. that we we obviously need to continue fighting in politics. Uh, we certainly must be, I think, re-emphasizing the local, which is an area that I think the right has often uh, done a, a very poor job of fighting in. Uh, part of it is sort of the, the intellectual conservative world really directs people towards sort of judges and the Supreme Court and the Constitution and all that stuff. And so people sort <laughs> yeah. of, their ambitions are channeled toward things like uh, go to law school and become a clerk. Well, how about uh, how about actually gain control of a local institution that you can meaningfully change that is going to uh, meaningfully affect uh, what your uh, family's uh, life is like, whether your 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 kids can use the library, whether your uh, yeah. whether the park is is sort of safe and that that's actual uh, property available for uh, you to live a better life. Uh, and then uh, alongside that sort of my focus is on the the business and technology realm, where again, uh, I believe that's actually the most open domain for a lot of the what are still political battles that will be fought uh, that shape the, uh, the the nature of the digital era. Awesome. All right, let's wrap this up. Nate, thanks so much for taking time with us today, being here on Dead Men Walking Podcast. Why don't you give us a final thought for a listener out there listening? They're interested in what you're talking about. They're interested in technology or politics or business ownership. Give us a final thought on something you might say to them to either encourage them or, or put them on the right track and then throw out your socials for us and where people can get a hold of you if you want them to uh, contact you online. Sure. Well, my final thought is I encourage uh, I, I, I encourage those who are stepping up. I think that it takes a minority of people to change things. Uh, the more we especially the more we can organize, the more that the more that we can do business with other people who are aligned with our values, the more that we can work with mm. them, we can get together with them and connect in other ways. That is building networks that have the ability to be incredibly powerful and robust in the face of much broader disruption. Uh, and that is, uh, that is what we are. Uh, and it doesn't take nearly a majority of people to change the direction of a society. Most people are going to go along with the flow. So if we're able to build those, if we're able to build things that are, uh, that are set up to survive uh, what can be a, a profoundly disruptive time, we can shape uh, not just our own lives during that period, but potentially uh, have those remain the anchors that a lot of the rest of society reorganizes around. Uh, mm. Are In terms of what we're doing, uh, fundamentally, you can go to newfounding.com, talent placement. We have a talent network. We have an incredible network of, of very, very strong people. So if you own a business and you're looking to hire there is an opportunity going through Values Align Networks to hire a higher caliber of people than have often been available to small businesses for the last uh, last couple of decades. Uh, we focus on engineers, professionals, executives. Uh, we have a uh, growing number of those. If you're looking for a job, again with Align People, we can help you. Uh, we can help you find one. So go to newfounding.com. Uh, we match founders and investors with our deal room. I uh, would love to have you sign up there. And then finally, my. Uh, my social is uh, Twitter is the main place that I'm active uh, at Nate A. Fisher on uh, on Twitter. And I uh, I talk a lot about that. I talk a lot about uh, a lot about what I'm doing on the uh, American reformer side and on the Christian side. So I uh, would love to uh, stay in touch through that. Awesome. Nate, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. This was a great conversation. Absolutely. And guys, thank you for listening to another episode of Dead Men Walking Podcast. We appreciate all of your comments, all of sharing uh, with friends and telling a friend. And uh, we'll link everything up uh, Nate talked about on the on the podcast episode. Uh, all his socials will be there too. So make sure you give him a follow and engage with him. Uh, check out what he's doing. We, we really are excited about guys like that and what they're doing in those spaces. As always, guys, uh, we appreciate you. We love you. And remember, the chief end of man to glorify God and enjoy him forever. God bless. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Dead Men Walking Podcast for full video podcast episodes and clips, or email us at deadmenwalkingpodcast at gmail.com. None you